It was early on the morning of February 14, 1989, in Jackson, Mississippi. 66-year-old businessman Leonard Moran was driving to meet some friends for breakfast, as he often did. But on this Valentine's Day, he would never make it to the restaurant. Twenty-seven-year-old Lynn Porter was driving just behind Leonard Moran through rush hour traffic as they neared a busy intersection. The man in front of me, he just leaned over his front seat very slowly. And I thought, well, maybe he might be picking up something or using a car phone. Because he did not come back up, for some reason it just went in my head that this, this guy's having a heart attack. Something's not right here. And I knew that the car's got to be stopped. Unaware of Lynn, Mark Gallagher was approaching Leonard's car in the right-hand lane. As I went around the car, my truck is so high, I looked down in it and I saw a man laid over the seat. And the only thing that went through my mind at first was, I've got to stop that car. Because if we get in the middle of that intersection, somebody's going to get hurt really bad. So I sped up. I was running at full speed. I could just almost feel the, the muscles in my face being pulled back, trying to catch up with his car. I pulled up 100 feet in front of the car, thinking that it had just hit the back of my truck and stopped it before it got into the intersection. His foot had come off the accelerator and the car was slowing down. I was trying to open the car door and I could not keep my footing. I was hanging on the steering wheel. It did go through my mind, I'm fixing to be swept underneath the car. While hanging on with my right hand, I took my left hand and tried to put down the emergency brake. When I couldn't push down the emergency brake, I threw myself on top of him and threw it into park. He was laying across the front of the seat, and I put my ear up to his mouth, and um, I couldn't hear any breathing. He was not breathing at all. As we got there next to each other, I said, go call for help. I picked him up and put him in the middle of the street. He was a bluish color. Felt for a pulse. There wasn't a pulse. I felt for a heartbeat. There wasn't a heartbeat. He wasn't breathing. So I started CPR. I hadn't taken CPR in 15 years. I ran to one house. There was no answer. I went to another house. I said, please. I said, please, you know, someone help. I was scared. I thought he was dead. It was real hard doing it by yourself. I knew I couldn't stop. There was no way you could stop. If you stop, the man dies. When I went to the houses and no one would answer it, I got discouraged because I remember I've taken CPR courses and I knew you've got four minutes to react before brain damage might set in and I knew something had to be done fast for this gentleman. In the paint store across the street, off-duty fireman Howard Taylor was working at his part-time job. She came in and I heard her hollering somebody had a heart attack. But she was so upset. I told her, you call for help. I know CPR and I go out and start CPR on me. And that's when I, I grabbed the phone and called 911. The call for help came in at 8.13 a.m. Right, department, what's your emergency? Rescue vehicles were immediately launched, but the nearest ambulance, with the life support equipment they needed to shock his heart into beating again, was five miles away. When I got out there, there was a man doing CPR. He was doing the best he could do. He didn't have his rhythm just right. I identified myself as being a fireman. I checked the vitals. He had no signs of life, no pulse. He wasn't breathing. And I said, well, let's go. We got to do it. And I started compression. When I started doing the mouth to mouth, his lips were blue, real blue. There was not, in my mind, he was dead. When we continued, I was very distraught.
It had been seven minutes since Leonard Moran's heart stopped beating. After I went back, I wanted to get in there so bad and help. And they were working so hard, and I wanted to be part of it. I really wasn't aware of what was going on around me at the time. We would stop occasionally and check his pulse, but we never got a pulse, never got a heartbeat. Come on, breathe! As we worked on it, it was in the back of my mind this guy wasn't going to make it. But we kept doing the CPR until he up arrived. I've been a fireman for 12 years, and that's the first time a fire ever looked that good to me. Fire department EMTs took over from Howard and Mark. Okay, what we got here? Uh, full cold. Okay. I got up. I, I was weak on my knees, big time. I wanted him to live real bad. Two, three, four, five. We did manage to get his call back before the fire truck arrived. And from that point on, it was in their hands. Y'all did a good job. Good job. Paramedic Keith King and his partner arrived with the fully equipped ambulance and took charge of the situation. When we arrived on the scene, they were doing a very efficient CPR and had kept his condition from deteriorating any further. Time was running out for Leonard Moran. Everybody clear? One, two, three. Okay, still no pause? Initially, when uh, we shocked, he came back with no activity. After we gave uh, a couple of rounds of drugs, he came back into a, a rhythm, but he had no pulse. And at that point, I thought he was going to die. I was very distraught after I realized that he didn't have any vital signs even after they hit him with those paddles. I looked around and all the faces kind of went together. The next thing I knew, they were loading him in the, in the ambulance. And the whole time, I was thinking maybe I could have done better. I remember going up to him saying, how is he, how is he? And they said, we don't know, we don't know. I really thought the man was dead, but um, there's always that second chance. I was very concerned whether he was going to make it or not. So I called Station 8. And I asked him, I said, uh, is Mr. Moran doing all right? He said, man, you did it. You did. I said, I did what? He said, that man is alive. He, he opened his eyes right as we got there. Seventeen minutes after his sudden death heart attack, Leonard Moran's heart finally began beating again. I say, wow. I say, I did it? He said, yeah, you did it. You did it. Oh, oh you missed it again. I did it. Let me take a shot. Leonard spent two weeks recuperating in the hospital, and he still faces heart bypass surgery, but his prognosis is good. He and his wife of 39 years, Mary Louise, have not forgotten the people who helped him that day. Had it not been for them, I wouldn't be here. They are in my thoughts almost every day, really. Sometimes it's hard to talk about that. They're uh, very special people to me. After I saw Mr. Moran in the hospital and were able to see that he was living I'll never be able to describe that feeling. It's uh, just a, a, a touching feeling that, hey, we've all pulled together, and everyone pulled together, and there, this man lived. And about three weeks later, we all had dinner with him, and then he gave us a plaque, and it was a heart, and then you knew he was going to be all right. And I think, if anything, through this situation, if I can emphasize how important CPR is, to know at least you can give a guy a second chance. You either can stay in there and look at him, or you can give him a second chance. I thank God that I knew when it counted. What a wonderful, 
wonderful gift to get him back on St. Valentine's Day. I could have lost it, but I didn't. I got him back. And he's going to stay around for a long time. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Let me go find him. If you are interested in learning CPR, contact your local office of the American Heart Association or the American Red Cross.